Hello. Welcome to part two of nonlinear microwave circuits with Professor Patrick Roblin. Today's focus will be on the design of high efficiency power amplifiers using nonlinear embedding. <clears throat> I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by our MTTS Education Committee. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up, so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. In your question in the Q&A box in the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current page if you have any problems, whether it's with video or audio. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. You may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides to be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Professor Patrick Roblin received the Maîtrise de Physique degree from the University of Louis Pasteur in Stra Strasbourg, France in 1980, and the Doctor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of uh, from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri in 1984, where he worked with Professor Marcel Mueller and Fred Rosenbaum. In 1984, he joined the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where he is currently a professor. His research interests include the measurement, modeling, design, and linearization of nonlinear RF devices and circuits such as power amplifiers, oscillators, and modulators. He has authored and co-authored two textbooks, is the founder of the Nonlinear RF Research Lab at OSU, and has developed two educational RF microwave laboratories and associated courses for training both senior undergraduate and graduate students. Professor Roblin's early research, research interests were focused on the physics of semiconductor heterostructure devices and the electro electrothermal measurement and modeling of semiconductor devices. In the last 10 years, he has developed new types of nonlinear broadband and pulsed RF measurements with a large signal network analyzer. More recently, his group reported embedding device models for SOS MOSFETs in GAN devices. His group subsequently demonstrated the application of such embedding device models to the design of Doherty RF power amplifiers. In addition, his group has pioneered frequency selective behavioral modeling and predistortion linearization of multiband RF power amplifiers and continues to extend the state of the art in that field. Professor Roblin is an active member of the ARFTG, where he is currently responsible for the ARFTG IMS workshops and co-organizes the NVNA Users Group Forum. He organized the ARFT AG82 conference in Columbus, Ohio in November 2013. Now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Professor Patrick Roblin for part two of this two-part webinar series on Nonlinear microwave circuits, design of high efficiency, high efficiency power amplifiers using nonlinear embedding. Patrick? Um, thank you, uh, Professor Mil Milton. And um, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My pleasure to present part two. This presentation is uh, dedicated to the memory of Professor Fred Rosenbaum, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. In part two of this presentation, we'll talk about the direct extraction of socket-based models from NVNA measurements and the design and verification of power amplifiers. <clears throat> so uh, we'll start with the direct extraction of socket-based models from NVNA measurements. We'll first introduce real-time active load pool and then uh, present some uh, extraction, simultaneous extraction of IV, uh, charge voltage, and also parasitic uh, bipolar uh, transistor in uh, SOS MOSFET. A section on self-heating and trapping is reserved in appendix in, in case there are some questions. So let us get started. In part one, we introduce vectorial nonlinear measurement with NVNS. And we saw we could acquire the multi-harmonic CW signal. You see in the bottom of the screen the harmonics and also um, the reconstructed uh, current waveform in a time domain. 
We can also acquire modulated waveforms, various modulated waveforms are shown there. So with NVNA, we can acquire the waveforms. Essentially, we me the NVNA measure the incident and reflected waves at the fundamental and harmonic, and we can reconstruct the voltage and the current and if, at all of the harmonics, eventually, some of them and obtain the voltage and current waveform versus time. This permit to perform waveform engineering to assist, uh, for example, with PA design. So the advent and uh, development of uh, deployment of nonlinear vector network analyzers has created an incentive for using large signal characterization instead of conventional small signal characterization for device modeling. Some pioneering work that are indicated below. The main advantages are the model parameters are extracted under realistic device operating conditions. The number of needed measurements can be re reduced rather dramatically. We'll see uh, present uh, some evidence of that here and model accuracy can be improved. So first we present real-time active load pool, which is used uh, with NVNA. Um, as you know, um, active load pool is a mean to implement a specific reflection coefficient at the output. You can excite, for example, a transistor with a signal at the input, and a signal at the output could be at the fundamental or an harmonic, and set the reflection coefficient of the load that way. If you uh, add an offset delta omega at the signal at the uh, output, you obtain a real-time active load pool. In that case, the reflection coefficient is modulated at the frequency delta omega, and you obtain closed line uh, trajectory for the re reflection coefficient. If you do several of those measurements for various powers, you obtain uh, multiple closed line trajectories, and you're covering effectively the Smith chart in a few uh, measurements. You have therefore acquired all the data to perform uh, contour plot, uh, obtain contour plot of the power or the efficiency um, in the reflection coefficient of the fundamental or the second and third harmonic, depending on the frequency you injected at, at the output. You could also do source pool, by the way, active source pool. One interesting feature about real-time active load pool is that it has a huge coverage of the IV characteristic while doing a single measurement. Single measurement is typically 10 milliseconds of uh, a large signal network analyzer. So uh, if we have a look at the real-time active load pool of, at, uh, with a frequency of 600 megahertz, for a 60 nanometer CMOS, this is very low frequency for such a fast device. We are actually only exciting the IV characteristic, and from the load line which result, we can extract the IV characteristic. The dotted lines there are shown to be very close to the measured uh, IV characteristic represented by the plane line. So this is a very interesting uh, feature of real-time active load pool. And we're going to put it to use to characterize an SOI MOSFET, actually uh, a semiconductor on uh, sapphire MOSFET. So this device is shown below, and it is indicated also that there is a parasitic bipolar transistor present in this device. This parasitic uh, transistor is only uh, activated at low frequency and therefore doesn't respond to the RF, but only responds to the baseband signal. It, it's usually featured by a kink in the IV characteristic. So we are going to perform uh, a single real-time active load pool measurement. Single means 10 milliseconds typically. We use the purple one there shown. We get associated uh, coverage for the voltage and gate, the drain voltage and gate voltage as shown on the top right. The advantage of this approach, we can go in extreme regions such as breakdown, which can be characterized without device degradation. There's no need for multiple bias conditions uh, and multiple load impedances. 
and uh, RF powers to obtain a wide coverage, uh, voltage coverage. And finally, it's, since uh, the modulation can be uh, very fast, uh, this is an isothermal measurement and isotrapping. The traps don't have time to change their state of occupation. So now we're going to apply uh, this measured data uh, to the extraction of uh, neural network model. Here on the bottom right, you see a model. There is an intrinsic transistor surrounded by the uh, conventional parasitics, which you can easily uh, characterized by two uh, small signal frequency using the method of cold FET. The intrinsic transistor includes itself, it shows itself a drain current, a drain charge, and a parasitic bipolar transistor, which only responds to the best burn signal, as indicated in the green box. To model those uh, three components, the drain current, the drain charge, and parasitic bipolar transistor, we're going to use three different neural networks, as indicated in the bottom left. So uh, after the embedding to the intrinsic reference plane, we are applying those model equations we have shown there. And we can extract the load line, as shown here on the, uh, on the top left. The current waveform the drain charges, and the contour plot. Finally, here we have extracted the IV characteristic, which is shown as the blue line, that is seen by the device at RF frequency. Notice that this IV characteristic is different from the DC IV characteristic you measure from the same device at low frequency. So essentially, at high frequency, the transistor sees a different IV characteristic because the parasitic bipolar doesn't but plastic bipolar transistor doesn't have time to react to the RF voltages. Similar uh, commercial tools are available, such as the DynaFET from Keysight, an example of simulation results with contour plots and uh, power sweeps are shown here on this slide. Those results were obtained by the group of uh, Dr. Roots at Keysight. OK, we're going to shift gear. It's not that cold uh, in Ohio, but uh, possibly in winter we'll get there. And we'll go now on the par in uh, the second topic, which is uh, concerned with the design and verification of power amplifiers. So we'll first uh, mention the problem associated with conventional waveform engineering. Essentially, there is a huge harmonic space to search. And we'll then provide a solution, which is PA design with nonlinear embedding. Finally, we'll uh, talk about various uh, amplifiers, class B, class F, class J, Doherty, and KX uh, amplifier examples. And to conclude, we'll talk about the NVNA uh, model verifications uh, the, the verification of the embedding model uh, using an NVNA. So as uh, mentioned in the introductions, with an NVNA, we can acquire the waveforms at the package reference planes. Here on the top, you see the voltage waveforms in blue, the current waveform in red. And below, you have the instantaneous power dissipation, which is the product of uh, the drain current times the drain voltage. A common assumption is to assume that we want to, to maximize the efficiency, is that we want to minimize the product of the drain current times the drain voltage at the package reference plane. But that actually is not quite correct. If we look at the instantaneous power dissipations, Part of the instantaneous power dissipation includes positive part, which is associated with not only dissipations, which we will rather minimize, but also storage of energy. And so therefore, um, just minimizing the instantaneous uh, power is not the desired goal. We want essentially the positive uh, power uh, dissipations be balanced by the negative 
power dissipations, which is shown, and co which corresponds to the RF power generated. So therefore, we need to minimize the average, as shown on the center right, of the average over an RF cycle of the product of the drain current times the drain voltage. So the question is how to find the best waveforms to do that. To find the optimal uh, impedance termination at the source and the load, fundamental and harmonic load pool and source pool are used, typically. So let's give an example. You take, for example, class F, which requires at least three harmonics. If we consider the case of 10 input power levels, with 10 degree step for the second and third harmonic, which are, remember, on the edge of the Smith chart, we need to have, if we calculate the number of measurements we need to perform, we have 100 points for the fundamental, so since we need to explore uh, the inside of the Smith chart for the fundamental reflection coefficient, 36 points for the second and third harmonic, since we're using 10 degrees, uh, for uh, for resolutions, and we have 10 power points. So that leads to millions of simulations that we have to perform with only 10 degrees accuracy and only uh, three harmonics. If now we also include the source and the beside the load and consider the second and third harmonic, we need to multiply by another 36 square, and we see that we this simulation search requires one billion of simulations for an approximate result. So essentially, it'd be great if we could find a scheme to come up with the result in a single simulation, bypassing all these simulations. Here we see, for example, uh, a play, uh, a plane showing uh, with, for the x-axis, the second harmonic phase, and for the, the vertical axis, the third harmonic phase. And we see if we are looking for class B, this corresponds to a certain point, and it'd be great if we didn't have to search the entire plane to just locate that point. And here we're just looking at the harmonic when Tim mentioned um, the reflection coefficient in the fundamental, which adds more, more searches. So essentially, uh, the traditional approach is to perform the load pool at omega, 2 omega, 3 omega, source pool at 2 omega, 3 omega. And source pool is very important. You can get 10% efficiency uh, improvement. So we would like to suppress these processes and in a single cast, in a single simulation, come up with the optimal reflection coefficients that we want, we are looking for. So this can be achieved if we design the PA using embedding. So let's take the case of a single transistor PA. We use class B as an example for six different loads. So usually the measurements are performed at the package reference plane, which is indicated by the dashed vertical black lines for the package device. And you see the load line there associated with the device on the center left for six different loads, which are shown on the center right. We have six different loads for the fundamental. And for the second and third harmonic, we see we are on the edge of the Smith chart, essentially. How do we know we are in class B? We need to look at the intrinsic reference plane indicated by the red line, where essentially we have access to the IV characteristic of the device, which is memoryless. And we observe indeed that on the top left, the load line is in class B for 64 uh, loads, which are shown on the top right. For the fundamental, we see the, uh, the red um, circles are for the uh, six different fundamental loads, and we see the second and third harmonic are all correspond to a short as uh, required for class B. So traditionally, to in, if we are using a simulator to find um, essentially the class B operations, we have to explore all the possible waveforms possible to achieve the performance that we are displaying on the top left and right there. 
That's the other that if we use an embedding model, we can reverse the process and have a much more efficient approach. We can start with the load line that we desire, class B load line in that case, and using the embedding model, we can move from the current source reference plane, the, represented by the red dash line, vertical dash line, to the black vertical uh, dash line, which is the package reference plane. And we obtain in six simulations, since we have six different loads here, in six simulations, we obtain the exact waveforms, both at the gate and the drain of the transistor. So the idea for uh, PA design using nonlinear embedding was first introduced by Professor Raffo in Italy for, to account for low frequency memory effect, a very frustrating effect, since as we mentioned in the first part of our presentation, um, the IV uh, followed by the device at RF is quite different from the IV measured at DC when you have memory effects such as self-heating self -heating and trap, trapping present. So his idea was um, to measure the intrinsic load line and an intrinsic uh, and at intermediate frequency, FB, which is larger than the trap frequency or the self-heating frequency, usually in the order of megahertz at most, but smaller than the RF frequency so that the charges of the device basically don't respond, and there is no displacement current, and we are directly obtaining the load line of the IV characteristic as shown by uh, the red line there, the baseband load line. Then, by post-processing of the data in, simula in uh, modeling, we can add the contribution of the charges at whichever frequency you want and predict the waveforms we need to supply to the device. We're going to present an alternative uh, method which doesn't require any measurements. It's based uniquely on the model, so it's model-based embedding. And we're going to sh uh, show how we can re readily develop an embedding model. So we start with, at the top left, uh, the IV character shown by the, um, the purple circle there. And uh, this is for single transistor in that case, and we are using it the way we want, class B, class E, class F, J, whatever you want to do, you build your circuit and simulate it using this IV characteristic. And um, on the top right, we're showing um, the charges, the linear drain charge, and also the uh, drain resistance, RD, which uh, fit, is featured in extrinsic model. And we'd like to move from the intrinsic waveform, the voltage and the current at the IV characteristic, to the voltage and the current at the extrinsic uh, gate and drain terminals. How to do that? It's a very simple pro process, which is uh, 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 frequently done in um, device modeling. We just need to add the current contributed by the drain charge, the displacement current coming from the drain charge, which is time derivative of the drain charge. Remember, we have a model, so we already have the drain charge. We know the intrinsic gate voltage and drain current since we, on the top left, simulated them. So we just uh, add this displacement current to the, drain, the intrinsic drain current, and we have uh, the extrinsic drain current, ID. For the voltage, we just need to add the voltage drops to the resistor, and we have the extrinsic drain voltage at um, um, the external uh, reference planes. So this embedding uh, model, the embedding model is going to implement this simple mass in a circuit, so that circuit designer can just drop this uh, model into their design and do this embedding uh, readily after having simulated with the intrinsic PA, uh, shown on the top left, which is the IV characteristic. We can also reverse the process. We can go from the extrinsic reference plane to the intrinsic reference plane. In that case, uh, as you see, instead of pluses, we have minus uh, signs and equation. I can develop also a simple circuit model. So, in summary, we have now three types of models. We have the conventional model, 
which takes as input the gate voltage and the drain voltage at the package reference plane and predicts the drain and gate current at the package reference plane, as well everything inside the device model. Recently, as was mentioned, uh, PA designers have requested to have access to the intrinsic uh, uh, current source there of the IV characteristic to know the mode of operation of the transistor. So this is the conventional model. We go from the input, the gate voltage, to the output, um, the, current, the, the current of the gate and the drain. The embedding model proceeds in different fashion, similar to ABCD parameters. We start with the intrinsic uh, voltage and current of the IV characteristic. We define the mode of operation that we want. And then we embed and calculate the current and the voltages at the package reference plane, gate and drain side. An example of, of this process was shown in the previous slide. We can reverse the process, go from the extrinsic uh, voltage and current waveform and go to the intrinsic uh, voltage and current waveform at the intrinsic reference plane. And that's the embedding. So embedding, the embedding is circuit-based. It's just a model you introduce in your circuit simulator. It can be used with harmonic balance or even time domain simulations. It is model-based. There is no measurement which is required whatsoever. The model, the embedding model, <coughs> use exactly the same model parameter as the conventional model. So there is no extraction whatsoever of model parameter for the embedding model or the embedding model. It's simply a different circuit topology. Finally, we can include uh, high and low frequency dispersion effect. We see, uh, for example, in the embedding model, if you uh, pay attention, there is also the temperature which is calculated. Intrinsically, you could also calculate the traps, the trap occupation factors. So with the embedding model in a single simulation, we can replace in for single power, a single bias condition, 168 million simulation of measurement. Remember when we use only 10 degrees of resolution and only three harmonic. The embedding model does all the harmonic and uh, with basically uh, zero degree of accuracy. I mean, a maximum accuracy in the phase. 17 digits uh, usually used for the calculations in um, harmonic balance simulations. Finally, the last feature, which is very important for people developing models for their um, technology, is that all those models can be put in a black box. So therefore, no information and technology is provided, just a model is provided to the users. OK, here we're going to see an example of an embedding model for the Angelov model. So the Angelov model is shown in this slide on the top. You see that we can start from the current source reference plane, which is shown by the red line. You see the IV characteristic of the FET. Then we can add the nonlinear uh, charges or capacitors, as I showed it, between gate and source and also gate and drain, drain and source. And move to the extrinsic reference plane, we add also the linear parasitics. Then you can add the package parasitic and move to the package reference plane, shown in dark blue. And if you are measuring your device using connector, you have also a test bed, which you can uh, model using here TRL. So here we're presenting the embedding model for uh, the Angelov model. You notice that the circuit topology is quite different. It consists here in nine different sub-circuits. First, the simulator solves for the IV characteristic. Then it adds the charges, and so on. So it's a layer topology. As a consequence, there are basically no convergence problem. And the simulation are ultra fast when using the embedding model, since it, the simulator moves from one layer to the next layer. It never needs to come back to the previous layers. 
Finally, it can include some of dispersion, as in the case of the Angelov model, and we could add include uh, uh, trapping. Further, this is an exact process. The model and the embedding model and the de-embedding model are 100% self-consistent. So, in summary, for the class B example, we see that we can start with a textbook PA model where we see on the top left we have a sinusoidal drain voltage, we have a half wave a sinusoidal rectified current, we see the load line in the center, the top center, and you see the reflection coefficient associated with the fundamental and the third harmony. With the embedding model, in six simulations, since we have six different loads there, we are obtaining the exact waveform at the drain and the source that you need to apply at the package reference plane of your device so that you have this ideal class F operation. Notice at the bottom right, you see the reflection coefficient for the fundamental, the second and the third. So again, single simulations per power and uh, bias replace millions of simulations of searches. But is load pool required at a current reference, a source reference plane? As uh, in this slide, we show the drain efficiency versus the second and third harmonic voltage phases, theta 2 and theta 3. Remember, the reflection coefficient for the harmonic, the optimal one, are always on the edge of the Smith chart. Therefore, we only need to vary the phases of, of the second and the third harmonic. As a consequence, we, the efficiency is going to be periodic in the theta 2 and theta 3. So, for example, class B corresponds to a shorted uh, second harmonic and a shorted third harmonic. Class B, since it's periodic, occurs at the four uh, corners there of essentially this uh, Brillouin zone, if you want. And um, we see class F, uh, inverse class B, which corresponds to an open for the second and the third harmonic, if we limit ourselves to two harmonic. Class F corresponds to a short for the second harmonic and an open for the third harmonic. Inverse class F corresponds to an open for the second harmonic and a short for the third harmonic. Class E is represented by the various white line. You also have to look at what you do with the fundamental impedances. And we also have continuous class J, continuous class F, and so on. So we see that if we are at the current source reference plane, we know where all our mode of operations are. We don't need to do a search. And you can see, actually, that class F and inverse class F and also class E can give the, uh, the best efficiency, essentially. So, in summary, there is no need for load pool or source pool at the current source reference plane. So let's do, uh, go first to a class F example. We're going to limit ourselves to uh, the third harmonic. We're applying a drain voltage VDD, a DC drain voltage, fundamental is VDS1, uh, second harmonic is going to be shorted, and VDS3 uh, is the third harmonic voltage. Ideal class F requires that we have rectangular voltages for the drain, and also uh, half wave rectified sinusoidal drain current, as shown in the center, top center pictures. The load line associated with those waveforms are shown here. For the case where we selected VDS3, the third harmonic, equal to minus 1.6 of VDS1. Notice that the third harmonic is 180 degrees out of phase with the fundamental. So let's look at the drain efficiency. It's, it is given by the RF power, the fundamental, divided by the DC power. It can be, through power balance equation, found to be equal to 1 minus the dissipate, dissipated power, fractional dissipated power, since it's divided by the DC, and minus the power dis dissipated by the uh, harmonic in the load. 
the dissipated power is the most important term in this equation. The most important term to minimize. And this is achieved by using an orthogonal waveform. We have already mentioned that. We need to do an average of the voltage times the current over an RF period. The harmonic play an important role in minimizing the dissipated power. The second harmonic um, can be minimized by setting a short for the second harmonic, and it's a requirement essentially to obtain an orthogonal waveform as well. The third harmonic is uh, minimized by using an open, and we could have used termination, another termination on the edge of the Smith sharp, but only an open will give us an orthogonal waveform. So, the minimization of the harmonic is important and readily achieved, but the most important is essentially uh, minimization of the dissipated power. Notice that when we do the subharmonic uh, tuning, the voltage is determined. The subharmonic voltage, VDS3, is determined. Some textbooks indicate that the optimal voltage would be uh, one sixth of the fundamental. However, an harmonic simulation or in measurements, uh, an arbitrary voltage is determined by the device. Not arbitrary, but specific voltage is determined by the voltage, by the simulation of the measurements. There has been a lot of speculation as the origin of the subharmonic voltages. It has been proposed that it could be uh, generated by the nonlinearity of the IV. However, this is a lossy process. If we use the embedding model, we can verify that it is the nonlinear brain to source capacitance which generate a subharmonic displacement current, which is 90 degrees out of phase with the fundamental um, voltage, since it's, we are dealing with a capacitor. And this displacement current, once terminated by an inductor, sustains the required voltage at the third harmonic, VDS3, which is 180 degrees out of phase relatively to VDS1, as we required. The advantage that this is a lossless process. And we can verify what is the inductance is by just adding the nonlinear charge, drain to source, drain to gate, and embedding, and we just find that we, the reflection coefficients that we required by using embedding in one simulation. We can perform a load pool and verify this is indeed a load pool at the third harmonic and verify that this is indeed the optimal uh, terminations. So we know now that a lossless process can provide the third harmonic voltage. Notice that the voltage VDS3, which is obtained for the third harmonic, depends on the large signal occurring point, that is the device bias and also the power injected at the fundamental. In general, this VDS is different from one six of VDS1, the fundamental, and in fact, the efficiency can be optimized by tuning the LSOP. So let's now verify uh, that class F can be obtained using embedding. We are going to apply the class F criteria at the current source, that is, remember, a short for the second, an open for the third. And after embedding to the package reference plane, we obtain the reflection coefficient, uh, gamma L3, represented by the circle and the cross. We can then perform a third harmonic load pool at the package reference plane this time, and we observed that, indeed, the predicted reflection coefficient is um, indeed the optimal one. Notice that the embedding model predicted the reflection coefficient slightly outside the Smith chart. The reason is that to have exact class F internally, you do need to provide a little bit of power. In practice, we'll just use the closest load uh, available on the edge of the Smith chart. Okay, we can apply also the embedding to the design of a class J uh, broadband PA. So, um, Professor Cripps has provided us with waveforms that we could use for the drain voltage so that uh, essentially we can implement the class J amplifier. The idea that class B requires short and it's difficult to maintain a short for the second harmonic, 
um, as we change the frequency. So if we low the, we, if we allow the reflection coefficient, the phase essentially, to move away from 180 degree, uh, as shown by the green trajectory, we can um, sustain a class B uh, characteristic performance in terms of efficiency and output power if we simultaneously also change uh, the reflection coefficients seen by the fundamental, as shown by the red curve in the Smith chart. Notice, however, there's a problem with clash day. As we were moving for the second harmonic, the blue, look at the reflection coefficient in blue, the trajectory versus uh, frequency is faster, it's moving clockwise. The trajectory for the fundamental is moving uh, no, uh, anti-clockwise. And so, therefore, this is non-foster and cannot be realized exactly with foster circuits. Let's look at how we can implement a clash day amplifier now. Uh, before that, let's indicate uh, essentially the, ref the trajectory of the reflection coefficient at the second harmonic and the third harmonic using the predicted by the embedding models. And so we see that the second harmonic, the brown curve, is still faster. However, um, um, the fundamental indicated by the purple uh, trajectory is turning anti-clockwise, is non-foster. So we still have the challenge. Uh, of implementing those reflection coefficients. But now we know exactly what to do to design the class J amplifier at the package reference plane. So let's look at an experimental verification of this design. This was performed by uh, Professor Rawat in India. You see uh, the simulations in uh, red, essentially, uh, obtained from the embedding model. And in blue, you see the reflection coefficients which are uh, implemented. Notice that for the fundamental, a foster trajectory is used uh, to, to approximate the non-foster trajectory of, uh, required by the embedding model. The performance obtained are shown on the top right. You see that again around um, 10 dB is obtained, an output power around 40 dBm, and an efficiency between 60 to 70 percent is obtained from 1.3 to 2.4 gigahertz. So we have presented examples of design using a single transistor, but could also use the embedding model for multiple transistors. So here we see a case of a two-way PA, could be Doherty or Carex. However, how can we effectively design um, um, an amplifier, a two-way transistor, since we cannot connect the IV characteristic together? However, if we think about it, the IV characteristic of the transistor are going to be connected together via the parasitic network, and the external network we provide for the harmonic termination, the input and output matching. So therefore, we can start with a textbook or T or CAREX PA um, at the intrinsic current reference plane, and then predict the required reflection coefficient that we'll need at the package reference plane to uh, uh, build and design the PA. So here are the simulations uh, done by um, Dr. Jang. You see um, the PA, which is realized using the IV characteristic on the top left. On the top right, you see the IV characteristic of a class F for the main PA. And the bottom right, you see the, IV car the load line, sorry, and the IV characteristic for um, the auxiliary PA, which is operating in class C. In the center, you see um, essentially the power contributed by the main and the auxiliary at peak power. The auxiliary PA is contributing twice the input power of the main PA. This uh, PA is implemented using an asymmetric uh, topology, and we use half the drain voltage, uh, supply, supply drain voltage, and but the same peak current. There's an advantage in doing that, since the main PA never go into a very high voltage, and therefore the traps are never activated. So now we're going to look at uh, the design using the embedding model. 
So first we see that uh, when we look at the reflection coefficient of the main at um, the fundamental, the gray dots, uh, they are all located on the real axis since this is a textbook design using the IV characteristic. We see both transistors a lot pulling each other, varying the load that they present to each other. Then using the embedding model, we predict the reflection coefficients at the package reference plane for the main and the auxiliary, uh, they are represented by the red uh, circles. So we know now the reflection coefficients we need to provide to the transistor for it to operate in Doherty mode. And we need to design the external circuit to provide those reflection coefficients. We also, the embedding model predicts also the harmonics, uh, the second and third harmonic required, and more harmonic if we want. And um, we notice that those harmonics are not much power dependent. And so that's very nice because that simplifies the design. They are slightly negative, remember, because uh, there is a low C uh, mechanisms to overcome inside the device, but we can just use the closest reflection coefficients on the edge of the Smith chart to implement them. Okay, so now we're going to realize the PA, given we have all the reflection coefficients that we want. Eventually, the fundamental reflection coefficient will be implemented by a conventional uh, combiner here using a uh, transformer on the lambda over 4 because we're going to uh, essentially use an offset line to transfer the reflection coefficients which are uh, complex to the real line using an offset line. It is possible alternatively to just simply design a coupler which is um, uh, transferring uh, those reflection coefficient, the red dots there, um, to essentially uh, design the, the coupler, and um, Professor uh, Fager has reported a uh, formula to do, uh, to do that. Previous to that, we have also implemented the harmonic terminations requested, um, predicted by uh, the embedding model for both the load and the source, as shown. In this slide, we are now showing uh, the performance obtained uh, from this, for this PA. You see that uh, the Doherty PA achieves 70% efficiency at peak power and 70, uh, close to 70% efficiency at back of power, uh, which corresponds to 9 dB below the peak power. The characteristic is that this device was uh, designed in about two weeks, designed, tested, fabricated in about two weeks. So it shows that uh, embedding can really greatly accelerate the design of PA. Next, we turn toward an example uh, for the CARX PA. CARX PA uh, are shown for the case of two ways and four ways uh, developed by uh, Professor Barton. The CARX uh, theory is usually presented using voltage waveforms. However, if we are going to uh, apply the embedding uh, technique, we need uh, CARX PA uh, based on current waveforms. So here you see uh, the design equation for a current waveform based uh, CARX PA. It's very easy to implement that. And if you use the embedding model, you can uh, verify, predict, and um, the um, essentially decrease of the power uh, when you move from the intrinsic reference plane to the package reference plane. You have, a, in that case, 6% degradation due to the loss of parasitic. So in this slide, we're showing the design of a CARX PA. You see the intrinsic uh, CARX PA designed initially, the prototype using the ideal equations. And then, using the embedding uh, device model, we know the reflection coefficients we need uh, at the gate and the drain at the package reference plane, and then uh, the required circuit are designed. And the resulting PA is shown there. It was designed by Mr. Chang and presented at IMS in 2017. Here's the experimental result he obtained. You see on the top left uh, the simulated and the simulation and the measurement, which are compared, purple and blue. And on the top right, you see that the efficiency, uh, the best efficiency, shown by the red line, varies from 80% at peak power to uh, 50% at 8 dB back off. 
uh, when measured uh, with LTE signal, an average efficiency of 50% was obtained. You can refer to his IMS paper. So we have presented the design of uh, power amplifier using an embedding model. It is important to uh, have access to high quality model to do that. So here we're going to verify we can use NVNA measurement to verify the quality of the model. So we go back to the case of the class F um, example we had covered before, where we had uh, six different loads, which are shown there, varying from uh, right to left, 86 ohm to 27, 27 ohm. Notice that the second and third harmonic were not perfectly achieved. There we use a passive test bed. We should have used active load pool so that they were exactly on the edge of the Smith chart. And here are the load lines which are obtained where we compare essentially uh, um, the angel of simulations in blue and uh, the de-embedded measurements as we go from the package reference plane to the intrinsic current source reference plane. We see that the load line are not in very good, perfect agreement, essentially. It's an OK agreement, but not perfect. So at this point, we can develop a figure of merit. We can compare the model, <coughs> which uh, remember a model used just the voltage and uh, waveform, so the gate and the drain waveform, and predicts the current um, uh, extrinsic and also intrinsic. And so here we're going to predict the intrinsic current. And we can use also the de-embedding model, which is similar to the embedding model. And this model doesn't just use the voltage, it uses also the current. It's like a BCD parameter. It uh, uses both the voltage and the current at the gate and the drain, and predicts also the intrinsic current. Those two models should give the same result if the model is consistent with the, the measurements. And so, essentially, uh, this is a uh, figure of merit which enables us to verify the accuracy in predicting um, the intrinsic uh, load line, or the, if you want the load line at the current source reference plane, which, remember, defined really the mode of operation of the transistor. We want to maximize the efficiency of the transistor at the current source reference plane, and we know what are the modes which achieve that. So um, for the case of the angel of model we had extracted, we had only 9% uh, accuracy uh, as far as this RMS figure varied. However, if we uh, look at the foundry model for this Cree transistor, 3% was uh, obtained. So the very accurate models are available. However, so far, we still have to convince Foundry to provide an embedding device model so that essentially PA designer can bypass uh, load pool and source pool. So in summary, let's review the advantage of PA design using embedding. We can replace millions of load pool and source pool simulation by a single simulation per bias and incident power. The designer can then focus on finding the best operating point, uh, the large signal operating point, which consists of DC bias and the incident, incident power at the fundamental frequency, knowing that the desired waveforms is always obtained. For example, we wanted class F, we will have a class F at each simulation we perform as we vary the DC bias or the incident power. So since we have bypassed the need for source pool, at the second and third harmonic, and load pool at the fundamental, the second and the third, this leads to a very efficient uh, design since we're only focusing on the DC bias and incident power. This also facilitates the design of broadband PA, as we uh, demonstrated with the Class J uh, design by Professor Awad. Finally, we can also predict the optimal harmonic injections. This was not covered. This is in a, uh, presented in the appendix if there are some question later on. Finally, it was noted that the nonlinear embedding model simulates much faster than the model itself due to its layered structure. The simulator goes to each layer one time in terms, and therefore the simulation is ultra rapid. 
NVNA measurements can then be used to verify the accuracy of the embedding model at the intrinsic current reference plane. So a measurement should always be performed. Sim designers don't always have access to uh, those measurements, but definitively uh, the model developer should have performed them so that the model are verified to be accurate and predict the correct intrinsic uh, operation of the device. So we have reached the conclusion of this presentation, and we're going to do a summary of uh, the material we presented in the second part of this talk. Essentially, we introduced new paradigms for nonlinear RF circuit measurement and design. The first one, which we discussed, was that circuit-based models can be extracted directly from NVNA measurements. This greatly reduced the number of measurements. We presented a model which was extracted in a single NVNA measurement. We had performed two small signal measurements to extract first uh, the parasitic devices using cold FET. But a single NVNA measurement was uh, used using real-time active load pool. We had seen in the part one that we could use behavioral models. And in part two, we presented here uh, circuit-based models. Finally, we uh, introduced the nonlinear embedding model, which eliminates the need for time-consuming multi-harmonic load pool and source pool uh, when the model is available. And we indicated that NVNA can be, could be used to verify the accuracy of the embedding device model with the help of a new figure of merit. This concludes my presentations. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Roblin. Very, uh, there's a lot of material to cover and a uh, very nice presentation of it. Um, we'd hope to have a few minutes to squeeze in some questions here. Um, maybe uh, maybe we have time for just uh, just one or two here. Let's, let's try to get a couple in here, just, but with just some short answers, please. Um, so one question okay. here is, um, how, how do X parameter techniques fit into the story here? Could you comment uh, briefly about that? Um, X parameters are not used with embedding model. Uh, behavioral techniques could be used combined with a physical topology that has been proposed. But here, uh, the focus of this presentation was on circuit-based models, essentially. OK. And then along those lines, um, how can, can these models be extended out to include other parts of uh, of the circuit, for example, balance in a differential type topology? Yes, we have shown example of uh, um, multiple transistors. Not that the transistor doesn't need to be an FET. You could have diodes, and you could have bipolar transistor, and you could have multiple transistors combined together, uh, absolutely. And the passive is the easiest to embed the embed. It's what's specific there is we are talking about nonlinear embedding and de-embedding. All right, excellent. OK, fantastic. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, there are a few questions left in the queue, and I believe the presenter will follow up on those uh, qu unanswered questions offline. As we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org, and all registrants will get an email reminder with that website address when it's available. For attendees who would like to receive PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code that's provided on the last slide of this presentation that is shown uh, right now. Uh, as noted previously, this was part two of a two-part webinar series, so please visit the education page of mtt.org where you can find the archived version of part one, which, presented on, which was presented on October 10th of, of 2017. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank Professor Roblin for this excellent and informative uh, set of presentations. Uh, and special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you will return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you, and have a great day.